Hey, here's what I want to make sure. I love the intensity. I love the focus. Couple things, though, especially on this field over here. Too many self-inflicted wounds. When you look at what's going to occur, without a doubt, I guarantee you, come September 13th, that weekend, there will be more fucking pre-snap penalties from teams that don't know how to focus and concentrate. We're going to be walking through a lot against one another. I know we all can't wait till we can actually practice football. It doesn't matter. We got to make sure that we continue to lock in, and we're never, ever going to be one of those teams that beats ourselves. That shit has to continue to minimize as we increase our reps. You guys with me on that? We're not going to beat ourselves. Because once we get practicing, that's where we really got to push ourselves to get better. Because this is the group that we're counting on on September 13th. Now turn the music up! Yes, coach. Welcome to the Hard Knocks podcast, where we never have self-inflicted wounds and we never, ever beat ourselves. That was Rams head coach Sean McVay, and I am your host, Peter Schrager. This is the podcast where we break down each episode of the HBO and NFL Films hit series, give you the inside scoop on what's really going on behind, even behind the scenes. We've also got the best guests who are on the ground with both teams, and we do it at a, to quote Chargers coach Anthony Lynn in this episode, a slide and glide tempo. This week's guest is the man himself, Rams head coach Sean McVay. A year ago at this time, he was the 33-year-old face of the future. He was the league's golden child, an NFL coach of the year at 31, and the youngest head coach to ever reach a Super Bowl at 32. But it wasn't an easy 2019 season for Sean McVay. His team missed the playoffs altogether. His critics came out of the woodwork to chop him down, and suddenly... There were a host of other young offensive masterminds getting a lot of the media love that he had received the previous two years. We'll talk with McVeigh about all of that, his 2020 Rams, and the Hard Knocks experience in just a bit. But first, let's get to episode two, where we actually had football being played. Imagine that. Feels good to be back. Sort of, kind of, as much back as it seems. Guys are running. There's pads on. And the Hard Knocks cameras have it all captured. As Chargers strength coach John Lott tells us bluntly in this episode, this ain't no pie-eating contest. And right out of the gate, we've got longtime Rams offensive tackle Andrew Whitworth sympathizing for the rookies across the league in NFL camps this season. You see, Whitworth, who's been in the NFL for 14 seasons, tells us that rookie year is hard enough in a normal NFL campaign. Without the reps, the time to impress, and the ability to prove oneself in a preseason game, this year's rookie class is truly at a disadvantage, not only from making NFL rosters, but from making impressions on the rest of the football world. And it's at that point in the episode where we meet maybe the NFL's best example of what a rookie could do to make a name for himself despite being a long shot in a typical NFL summer. Chargers running back Austin Eckler is that guy. In 2017, Eckler was an unheard of, unknown, undrafted player out of Western State, Colorado. And in the team's fourth preseason game that year versus the 49ers, Austin Eckler, wearing the number three for the Chargers, had himself a night. And there's a new running back. That is Austin Eckler from Western State, Colorado. And he's got a shot here. You can play. They find you these days. Hard Knocks narrator Liev Schreiber takes the Austin Eckler story from there. Today, he's the Chargers' featured back the recipient of a new contract worth $24 million. He's done what every long shot dreams of doing. Of course, Eckler is just one of thousands of great undrafted training camp long shot stories who've not only captivated us as fans, but who have inspired others to follow in their wake. These players arrive at training camp as unheralded individuals, and yet they find a way to impress in the summer months 
work their way onto the NFL roster and do everything and anything they can to make the team. Whether it's Super Bowl 46 hero Victor Cruz, Super Bowl 48 hero Doug Baldwin, or Super Bowl 49 hero Malcolm Butler, or in this case, Austin Eckler, the story always points to that first experience at training camp and in preseason games. I've gotten to know Eckler over the first three years of his NFL career, and this guy is as down-to-earth an NFL player as you will find. And that reason might very well be because of just how long of a shot he was to make an NFL team. What we don't learn about in this Hard Knocks episode is just how he ended up even getting invited to Chargers camp. I've got that story for you. You see, GM Tom Telesco has a front office of some of the best scouts in the sport. In Eckler's case, it was the work of longtime national scout Tom McConaughey. No relation to Matthew, or at least I don't think there's a relation to Matthew, who first identified this shifty running back out of a Division II college called Western State Colorado. So what did McConaughey see? Well, big time production, yes, but he also saw a player who was a four-year captain in college. Yes, a four-year captain. That means that Eckler was the captain of his college football team as a freshman. That is a first for me, and it is truly unheard of in college sports. So Austin Eckler, truly still a speck on the scouts' radars after that decorated Division II career, shows up to the University of Colorado's Pro Day workout in March, and he blows all the Division I guys out of the water. And that's when Randy Mueller, another scout for the Chargers, told the rest of the front office that he was with McConaughey on this, and they had to look long and hard at this kid that they had just discovered named Austin Eckler. Well, the Chargers then spoke with Eckler's college coach, a gentleman named Joss Baines, whose name they knew because years earlier, he was the coach of another former Hard Knocks long shot, then Jets running back Danny Woodhead, when Woodhead was a star player at Tiny Shadron State. Small world, you better believe it. Well, the reviews were in and they were all through the roof. Fast forward to training camp of 2017, where he was truly a stud. And then in preseason, where Eckler had those big running plays in the preseason game against the 49ers, and you think, okay, this guy might make the team. But speaking with sources within the Chargers front office and their coaching staff, it wasn't just what he did at running back. Remember, they had a guy named Melvin Gordon, a first round pick on the roster already. It was what Austin Eckler did in punt and kick coverage as highlighted in Eckler's speech to undrafted rookie Darius Bradwell in this episode that solidified his spot on the Chargers roster. Not kick returns or punt returns, but kick and punt coverage, meaning Eckler was the guy chasing down the return man. And remember, he was wearing number three that summer, not typically a single digit jersey number you would see on a player who is expected to make the team at running back. Well, Austin Eckler did make the team and he eventually got some real game action as a rookie. He even did a little air guitar as a touchdown celebration and found his footing in the NFL in the seasons to come. And back in March, before the pandemic shut this country down, Austin Eckler signed a $24.5 million contract extension. 15 million of those dollars are guaranteed. A long way from Western Colorado State and wearing a single digit on his jersey in preseason. And to Andrew Whitworth's earlier point, a story that is way more unlikely in this abridged training camp that we're getting during this bizarre 2020 NFL season with no preseason games. Every single NFL player has his own story, one that is the complete opposite of Austin Eckler's, look no further than Rams quarterback Jared Goff. A former first overall selection in the NFL draft, Goff has already squared off against Tom Brady in a Super Bowl. He's gotten a huge contract extension that is triple digits, and he's bought a new home where we find him and his girlfriend playing golf in his palatial backyard. How many hole in ones total do you have on here? How many hole in ones do I have? A lot, probably like 10. You know, we've done some good things, especially since Sean's been here, and I think there's a lot of unfinished things that we want to do, for sure. I think last year was a bit of a disappointment not making the playoffs, and ultimately winning the division is the goal, but 
um, we feel good about where we're at. You know, we feel really good, and I feel good about where I'm at. I think that it all just comes with time. You just mature, you learn more, you gain confidence, you have more experience, and you know how to handle situations differently, and um, usually for the better. Everything seems great, but trust me, Goff is a curious case this season. Despite his early NFL success, there are doubters abound. And after missing the playoffs last season in a year when young quarterbacks like Deshaun Watson, Lamar Jackson, and Super Bowl MVP Patrick Mahomes made major strides, there are several who still wonder whether Jared Goff belongs in that conversation. His head coach, Sean McVay, is going to do all that he possibly can to get the very best out of the young quarterback. Hey, what took so long on that one? Just waiting to see it. Huh? It's going through the cadence. No, I'm just saying to break the huddle. Because we, we, we'll we just took a delay. I, yep, I got you. We'll go faster. I Did got you, you not get that's it? On me. No, I just had to hear it twice. Oh, I love that. Hey, yeah. that's my favorite thing he's just said right there. That's oh. good. I can, I, hey, we can work with that. I got you. Turbo set. Good. Hey, that's what I like to see right there. Good job, boys. Let's roll. Let's roll. Let's roll. Good job, man. Yeah. Type of shit fires me up. That's a good job of regathering your poise. Nice shit, man. Love that. Good job. Turbo set. Hey, did you feel it? There we go. Da, 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 da. There it is, baby. Love it. Good. Football is fun. Here we go. Hit that oil. Let's go. In an NFC West division that includes star quarterbacks Russell Wilson, Jimmy Garoppolo, and the reigning NFL Offensive Rookie of the Year, Kyler Murray, it is understandable if Goff is sometimes the least talked about of the bunch. It's going to be the quarterback and the coach's job to make sure they're both right back in the conversation in 2020. Make no mistake, Sean McVay is the star of episode two. You can make the argument he's been the star of episode one and episode two. And we get direct access to his high energy, hands-on coaching style throughout these 60 minutes. Everybody repeat the last play. If this was just normal two jet right here, we only have two for possibly three. You guys with me on that? Yep. Let's call a spade a spade. We won't now, but Glad we're working it right now. Oh, we will. Hey, right now, let's tighten up on both sides. Here we go. No more repeats. No and no, you know. And now that we've seen it, and again, don't even stress about it. Just work this for the mechanics of the drill so we can coach off it. Yep. And this is good work, though. Okay, I'm taking my journalism, and that's written with a big J for you keeping score at home. I'm taking that journalism hat off here for a moment because I have known Sean McVay for eight years back when he was an assistant to the assistant in Washington. His story has been well documented, but when I first met McVeigh, it was at something called the Senior Bowl in Mobile, Alabama, and he was a 20-something-year-old guy, just like me, hanging around a bunch of older men and women in a bar who just happened to love football and be at a college football all-star game. So we start talking, and I realize this guy has the same enthusiasm for the sport that I do. Similar age, and we became fast friends. Hey, Shregs, what is going on, man? As his career progressed and he got promotion after promotion in Washington, it eventually led to an opportunity to become an NFL head coach. He wowed both the Los Angeles Rams and the San Francisco 49ers in interviews and accepted the Rams job where he quickly became one of the freshest faces in the entire sport. He's got boundless youthful energy, a photographic memory, and he has an ability to connect with players who are younger than him, players who are older than him, and coaches who in some cases are 30 years older than him that makes him a special type of teacher and a special type of guy. Now, the Hard Knocks cameras are on him, so he gets to exhibit what makes him such a great leader for a national audience. Sean, before we even get started with the real questions and talk football, your first words on this season of Hard Knocks last week were, babe, do you want some rosé? Um, did you or did you not catch shit from your friends and coworkers for that opening line? You know, it's funny you ask that, Peter, because I just got a bunch of shit from our whole offensive staff about that. You know, I thought I was going to catch the most grief for uh, being the idiot that took his shirt off on there. But the uh, <laughs> how about some rosé was probably even cornier. So uh, I have definitely gotten my fair share that is rightfully so. Uh, I would have shredded myself if, if I was uh, – 
if I was one of my friends too, it was it was quite embarrassing. See, I'm a rosé fan though. Like I, I understand it's everyone laughs. Rosé is delicious. It's oh no. Hey, listen, I'm not saying you don't like the rosé, but the way it sounded, it was just it was very you know it was a Brad sounding thing. Yeah, it was beneath you, but you know what? We all rebound. Um, did you watch the whole first episode? Like, where did you watch it when it first when you first got a hell? You know. What? So I watched it, uh, you know, we get a chance to see some of the scenes and then I watched it at home with Veronica, you know, cause I thought she came off really well in it and she was excited to see Callie on there. And then, uh, you know, and then I got a good, uh, ear lashing from my mom about some of my language. But other than that, you know, we watched it at home and it was, uh, it was definitely interesting to say the least. Your mom wasn't happy cause you are cursing in that first episode. Yeah. You know, that was, uh. That was the one thing, you know, my dad, when he and my, my mom and dad came out here, they're, they're such great parents. I love them so much. And when it became no, known that we were going to do this, you know, my dad said, Hey, Sean, you know, you should really watch your language. You know, you just want to be careful. I said, dad, you don't know what the F you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and it's HBO. It's not like it's, it's basic cable. This is, this is, premium you, cable. Still, you know, you just want to make sure though, with the, you know, some of the little kids and stuff, I do need to watch it. I, I got I to gotta be a little bit more mindful of it. I'm just around these guys. You get comfortable with it, but uh, I probably can tone it down. Here's what I say on it. You were swearing just in general. You weren't swearing at anybody, you know? Yeah, and you that's know me. The- that's not who I am. I'm not no. like that. But, you know, I, it, could, it could easily, you could maybe have the same effect without the language, but I would, have, I would imagine that this next episode is not any, uh, you know, step in the right direction of that. <laughs> I just got done watching it. You're absolutely right. Look, I have known you this entire ride with the Rams, and I feel like this year, or at least this off season, beyond the pandemic stuff, has been really different for this team and really for you. It feels like, and tell me if I'm wrong, but the McVeigh media bandwagon sort of emptied out a little bit over the last few months. The same media that was pumping you up and breathlessly praising you. Got a little quiet down the stretch last season. How does it feel to maybe not be the wonder boy this year and to maybe almost be under the radar? Yeah, I, well, you know what? I feel really good about the additions we've made. You know, we've talked about it, Peter. You know, we've got some great coaches that have already been in-house. Uh, we added some great coaches. I feel really good about the players we drafted, some of the players we added. Obviously, we've lost some great players, but uh, I think, you know, the narrative is fair where hey, we didn't live up to the expectations we had last year, but uh, by no means does that mean our expectations aren't to uh, to be right back where we've been. Uh, we know how much hard work that's going to take, but we're not short on confidence, but we know that you got to earn that confidence. But to say that there's a lot of motivation for a lot of good reasons, that uh, I think that would be fair. Yeah. You know, a lot of these coaches around the league have – have multiple kids. Some of them have grandkids. I think your personal situation, which we saw in episode one, it's you, it's Veronica, it's Callie, the dog, no little ones bouncing on your lap, you know, no, no people bothering you in the office. How did you spend the quarantine getting better as a football coach? And is there a silver lining perhaps to spending nearly six months in a bunker, just watching football tape, which I know you were doing. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that Peter. I, I think for me, what, what really came from that is you know, definitely a lot of football got, got to watch a lot of stuff and, and kind of be more still than ever. But I, I, I really do feel like I'm in a better place just, you know, as a person with the balance. And I think that will lead to being a better coach where you just have more energy, you're sleeping more, you're taking better care of yourself, you're more present with the people when you're at home. And, uh, you know, the, the more that you read and you kind of learn about it, I love this game so much, but being able to, to have some balance is something that I've always kind of strived for. And then I think you, are, you, you actually were able to see some of the returns and, and how that can enable you to be totally present when you're doing the football. But then when you're at home, when you're with Veronica or with your friends, you know, that comes up. But it's not something that it's on your mind to the point where, you know, you feel like you just can never really kind of shut it off. And I feel healthier and, you know, I, I think happier in spite of all the, the, you know, the unfortunate things that a lot of people are suffering through right now. And I think that'll lead to more sustained, you know, just success and consistency in a profession that you love, but being able to balance it has always been a thing that, you know, you know how I've talked about trying to find it. and, And I'm hopeful that, I'll still feel this way and be able to follow through with it when we're talking in week six as well. You know, it's it's amazing because it takes some people into their 50s, their 60s, well after retirement to even consider that balance, to have the gift to maybe acknowledge it at your age now. 
is huge. Um, I look at your relationship with Jared Goff. Jared Goff makes an appearance in the show this week. He's with his girlfriend in one scene playing golf in the backyard. But another is the two of you guys going back and forth on the practice field. And we're seeing the chemistry and we're also seeing your leadership. You're encouraging him, but you're also demanding of him. You've been paired with him since you've gotten here as a head coach. What is that relationship like? And how has Jared Goff grown? Not only the last three years, but maybe this entire off season and maybe turning into 2020. Yeah, I, th- I think he just said it, Peter. I mean, he's really growing up. I mean, he's he, we've had a lot of experience together. I think I can challenge him in ways where he knows that, you know, it's coming from a place of belief. And, and that's the good thing is we have an established rapport and, and a connection with one another that we can be hard on one another. And he can be the same with me. He can be honest. I think the, the big thing for us is being at a point where we can tell each other what we need to hear, not necessarily what we want to hear. And because we know that both of us are trying to, to help one another reach our highest potential. And ultimately that leads to good things for everybody that we care about in this building with the Rams. I think Kevin O'Connell has been really good. I mean, those two already have a really good rapport and uh, I know how much Jared respects him and, and he's been a great sounding board for me. So a lot of really good things. And, and I think, uh, I think we'll see a, a really uh, successful year for Jared leading the way. Yeah, for the listeners of the podcast who might not follow the Rams day-to-day, Kevin O'Connell is the new offensive coordinator. Can you tell us a little about him and what his role is when you're obviously talking with Jared on those practices, but behind closed doors, maybe it's Kevin doing a lot of the stuff that is the nitty-gritty that you used to do in addition to being the head coach, correct? Yeah, he's he's really, uh, you know, he's he's had a lot of success. You know, he played in the league. He's been coaching in some different places. Uh, he was most recently the offensive coordinator for the Washington football team. A lot of people that I hold in high regard, you know, just speak the world of him. He and I got connected a few years back, but he's he's really, I mean, he's he's the offensive coordinator. He's doing a great job running a lot of the meetings. Uh, he's a great sounding board, like I said, for me. I think he's a great communicator, great listener, and uh, his mastery of the position and really just the game in general really stands out, man, when you meet him. You know, he's one of those guys that that is uh, very, very impressive from the jump. Great dude. I've gotten to know him quite well, and I think that's a great combination of you, Kevin, and Jared together. I'm excited for golf this season. One thing I said last week on this podcast was how much I appreciated your vulnerability in the first episode when it came to talking about masks and social distancing. In fact, you tell your team, hey, you guys have to let me know if I'm slipping up. I know that I need to get better with this. Now that we're actually having real football practices, and I'm talking to you right now after the first padded practice and real physical contact, how are you guys balancing the sport of football with all of that energy and high contact stuff in the midst of a pandemic? Like, how has it been just actually watching football during these times? Yeah, the big thing, Peter, that I think has been really helpful is as you learn a little bit more about it, it's about risk mitigation. And the fact that we're getting tested every single day uh, we talk about keeping our ecosystem clear. And, and, you know, if everybody's doing the right things when they leave this building, then we are doing all the things to keep this building right. And uh, a lot of our meetings, really almost 100% of our meetings are outdoor where the air flow and you don't have the air particles that get trapped in the indoor settings. So that's been a big thing. Uh, anytime that I'll pull that down, which is, which is a good bit, you know, I make sure that I'm socially distanced from guys. But I think the big thing that we've talked about is, hey, washing your hands, wearing your mask, socially distancing when appropriate. But if we're doing all those things the right way consistently day in and day out and guys are making the right decisions off the field in the absence of the building, then they can go play football with a quiet in mind and be free because it's not going to just create itself. You know, it's got to be brought in from somebody that's a carrier. And the fact that everybody that's around this building is getting tested every single day and we get those results, you know, very early in the morning the following day, uh, it makes you feel very confident about the ecosystem we've established, the plans that the league have, and very confident that we can pull this off. And, you know, football, when you get out on the grass, Peter, it's feeling like normal football, and you really don't mm-hmm. notice it, to be honest. You're spot on, and I cannot wait to actually have a regular season game. And that is week one against the Cowboys. They come to town, and I think we're all excited to see how this is all going to look, and whether there's fans or there's not fans or whatever it is. That has to be your focus right now. And yet, this sounds like a silly question, I'm sure, and you're going to roll your eyes. But if there's anything more stressful than planning for an NFL week one of the season, it might be planning a wedding. So during a pandemic, how has that been going? And what have you and Veronica learned through that process in addition to worrying about the football stuff? Well, here's what I've learned. Get the hell out of the way. (laughs) Agree to a lot of stuff. So 
she no you know what in all seriousness she's done such a great job she's she, we've got great wedding planners but she's taken such great command of this and um you know we've gotten a lot of the you know the save the dates the different things like that kind of together but fortunately for us when we got engaged last year you know the only downside we were going to try to get married in france just because it would have been easier for some of her family from ukraine to get there and be centrally located but it was always going to be next july or june that we were going to do it so we didn't have to make two drastic plans uh we'll just do it you know i guess la is not a bad uh, second option no. if you will so it it's been uh it hasn't been stressful i think both of us have kind of looked at one another at one point and said you know we wish we were already doing this but it'll be a great day and i know uh i know i can't wait as much as she can no oh, and I, I would assume that rose will be served i would hope at least there you go rose you damn right peter before i let you go i asked anthony Lynn this question. Oh, give me a vodka gimlet, Sean. I would do anything. Hey, for man, us. just like us. Hey, just, I mean, think about it. When when we met up in New York City a while ago it was when I had just met her, and here we are talking about the wedding. It's an amazing story. It's probably five years ago. You and I out drinking at the Standard Hotel in uh, New York City, and here we are. You're 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 going to coach of the Los Angeles Rams, and you're getting married. That's incredible. Well, it, you were getting ready to to, to say, "Hey, I'm going to go audition for this Good Morning Football, and look at what a big star you become." Yeah. And you guys have done such a great job. I mean, it's it's a crazy world, but man, we're blessed. We are. You know, I, I want to wrap it with this because I do love you like a brother, and and I love getting to know you over these years, and. I feel like the Hard Knocks cameras are giving us a chance to see the real Sean McVay and not maybe the media creation, whatever that even means. But we're getting just raw, actual access and footage of how you talk to people, how you speak to your players, and how those coaches who in some cases are 10, 20 years your senior respect you. I asked Anthony Lynn this last week, and I want your take on it. For the people who are watching Hard Knocks who are not hardcore football fans. They're just fans of HBO. They might be Hard Knocks fans, but they're not hardcore football fans. If a casual fan is watching this show this season and had no idea who Sean McVay was, what is the one thing you want them to take away from these five episodes experiencing, you know, seeing who you are and what you're all about? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think more than anything, it's, it's somebody that cares about the people that you come in contact with every day and uh, we're all just trying to collaborate to, to make it a fun atmosphere that is goal oriented with, with high standards. But I think the, the, the number one takeaway you'd say is, you know, those are, those are people that are enjoying what they do and they care about one another. And that's an atmosphere and a, a group of people you'd want to be a part of. And, uh, you know, I know that's how a lot of people feel, or I'd like to think that. And, and that's the type of atmosphere and environment we want is where people can't wait to come back the next day. It's not like they're ever dreading it because, uh, there's an urgency, but an enjoyment about the way that we go about our business. It's so good. That's what I want to hear. Sean, thank you for the time. You're the best. Good luck the rest of the way. And no more bad language on hard knocks. How about that? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we can follow through with that, man, but I love you, man. It's always good to be able to catch you up and uh, I'm sure we'll talk soon. So that's Sean McVay, as polished a 34-year-old you'll meet, and a huge star not just in football, but in the city of Los Angeles as well. A guy who is hoping to be a star in Los Angeles is the Chargers' newest first-round pick, quarterback Justin Herbert. And yes, we get plenty more of those slow-motion, famous NFL shots of Justin Herbert throwing a football in this episode. It's like he's Bo Derrick emerging from the waves in the movie 10. And Herbert does look the part. His throws are spot on, but at some point, the pads will come on, and as Chargers coach Gift Smith says to Melvin Ingram, the bullets will be live. And the question surrounding Herbert isn't whether he can throw a football on air, it's whether this 22-year-old who grew up and played college football in the same town of Eugene, Oregon, can be the type of leader that is required to be an NFL quarterback. Narrator Liev Schreiber notes that Herbert is, quote, soft-spoken. Anthony Lynn expresses similar sentiments, but is that necessarily a bad thing? I can tell you that Herbert wasn't having any of that criticism when I asked him about it before the draft in April. He told me on the NFL Network's Good Morning Football that any teammate that's ever played with him would tell you straight up he is anything but quiet and that he is in fact a leader of men. And as a Rose Bowl MVP winning quarterback and the Senior Bowl MVP back in January, there's more than just slow motion shots of him throwing a football on his resume.
But in addition to just finding his voice in the locker room and amongst these other players, he also has to learn and master how to make play calls, do audibles, and take snaps from under center. And not just clapping out of the shotgun, as we saw he did at Oregon. He's got to do all of this, learn it all, master it, really, with just 14 padded practices on the docket and another quarterback taking the bulk of the first team reps this summer. Chargers quarterbacks coach Pep Hamilton has been around the game for a long time. He explains the process for us in this clip. You have to protect your linemen from defense alignment that are just getting off on us. You can ease just the angst for our offensive linemen by just, hey, taking charge and making sure that, man, all right, confidently they hear you say, man, this is what we're doing, okay? Because guess what? Once the ball is snapped, they still have to try and block Aaron Donald. We love the draft. We love rookies. And everyone expects Justin Herbert or Tua Tungavailoa, the Miami Dolphins first round pick, or Joe Burrow, the Cincinnati Bengals first round pick, one of these first round quarterbacks or two of them or all of them to step up and be the man right away. We've seen it in the NFL. Rookies do have success at the quarterback position. But as we are learning through hard knocks, it might take a bit of an adjustment period before we see any of the rookie quarterbacks thrive in 2020. Remember, they just got there. And this is a really abridged offseason. The message for fans of these players and teams, I would tell you, be patient. This episode also does a really good job capturing Andrew Whitworth and his family's bout with the coronavirus. Our nanny, Krista, had simply got a meal with a friend and, um, you know, come to find out that restaurant had a little bit of a breakout. And, and so um, she ends up coming up positive. And then eventually that led to Melissa and I getting it. And, um, you know, we decided to have the kids tested and turns out all four of them were positive. And so, um, you know, her family decided, her mom and dad decided to just kind of quarantine with us since they'd already been around us and, and we'd already exposed them to it. And sure enough, they, they ended up getting it right after us. Um, Andrew and I lost our sense of smell and taste. And other than that, just had very mild symptoms, headache, sore throat, things like that. And then my mom did pretty well. I would say she was sick, but she did pretty well. But dad, it just... It was really, really hard on him. Yeah, he spent five days in the hospital. And so we were, we were really, whew, we were scared there for a while, but he's out of the hospital and they're back home in Louisiana now and, and doing really well. Whitworth has long been the veteran leader of the Rams and before that he was the veteran leader of the Cincinnati Bengals. His story is a lesson for all of us to learn from. It's not necessarily your fault if and when you contract this disease. In fact, it could just be being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Every week on the Hard Knocks podcast, I'll pick my MVP of the episode. This week, I'm going to go with a coach, and it's Charger strength and conditioning coach John Lott. You see, Lott used to be the guy who would be hovering over the bench press at the Combine every year in Indianapolis, screaming in prospects' faces. He's a huge personality, and we get to see some of that when he's talking to undrafted rookie running back Darius Bradwell and telling Bradwell he's got to lose some weight. You're behind the eight ball right now yeah. with this weight. We just got to lose weight. Yes, sir. I mean, your sticking head coach is the next running back. Yeah. So he's going to look at you like a German shepherd with his ears up, yes, okay, sir. at an airport. This pucker's looking at you. He sees possibilities in you, you know what I'm saying? But yes, we sir. just got to get you. Yes, sir. You got to get your sticking mind right, okay? Remember I told you this ain't no pie contest. Now we're putting this time in you. Okay, I understand that. What you do in the dark shines in the light. Yes, sir. So don't be sticking to eating no sticking tacos at midnight on me. No, okay? I'm not do that. I'll put an investment into you. Yes, sir. In addition to naming my MVP each episode, I like to wrap the show by giving you something that I am interested in and I believe is worth tracking for next week. This week, it's Chargers defensive end Melvin Ingram's contract situation. Oh boy, another one of these. Yep. Last week, we discussed Joey Bosa, Ingram's teammate, getting a brand new contract, making him the highest paid defensive player in all of football. Ingram is there in the episode, and he seems more than pleased for his friend, discussing which kind of boat Bosa should buy. Hell, Ingram showed up to camp in a 2020 Polaris slingshot, color blue steel. We didn't get too much into Ingram's contract this episode, but as of Tuesday's airing, 
the star defensive lineman was in the midst of what is being called a, quote, hold in. Hold in? We've heard of holdouts. Hold in. Because holdouts are so punitive under the new collective bargaining agreement. That means there are massive fines. They're terrible for the player. Ingram is trying something new. He is attending practices, can't be fined, but he's not quite participating. So he's there, but he's not truly all in. Yes, they're calling this a hold in. The word is out that Ingram wants to get paid and he wants to get paid now. Oh, don't worry. This won't be general manager Tom Telesco's first rodeo. He's been down this road before, but it's just another thing to watch as the weirdest summer in NFL history plays out in front of our very eyes. And that's it for this week's episode of the Hard Knocks Podcast. Many thanks to Sean McVay, head coach of the Los Angeles Rams, for taking some time and joining us on the show. This was produced by HBO Sports and NFL Media. Make sure to check out the Hard Knocks Instagram page at Hard Knocks HBO for exclusive clips from training camp all week long. You can access even more Hard Knocks content on NFL.com, where NFL Network's Dan Hansis provides in-depth recaps of every episode. And hey, if you're looking for even more NFL news and analysis this season, check out the Around the NFL and the Move the Sticks podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, listeners, we want to hear from you. Feel free to tweet me at P Schrags. That's P-S-C-H-R-A-G-S on Twitter. Give us your feedback. Maybe there's something or someone you'd like to learn more about or there's a particular guest you want on the show. Give me a shout, tweet me, do whatever you want, just get in touch. I'm your host, Peter Schrager. Make sure to watch episode three of Hard Knocks next Tuesday at 10 p.m. Eastern on HBO and stream it on HBO Max. You can find the Hard Knocks podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, HBO Max, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. We'll be back with a new episode next week. Thanks so much for listening.